Good morning. Nice little breeze out there this morning, wasn't it? I told somebody I was going to have a bad hair day today. At least it's a hair day. There was a priest and a minister and a guru. They were discussing the best position to pray, to get the best results. While they were discussing this, there was a telephone repairman working nearby. Kneeling is definitely the best way, the priest said. No, said the minister, I get the best results when standing or sitting with my eyes closed and my head bowed. The guru broke in and he said, you're both wrong. He said, lying down on the floor is the best way to pray. And about that time, the telephone repairman couldn't take anymore and he broke in and he said, now fellas... The best praying I ever did, I was hanging upside down on a power line pole. I think if you're hanging upside down on a power line pole, you probably don't have a lot of choice in the matter. I don't know that position amounts to all that much. I think our attitude is important. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 7 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Without ceasing, Pray must, prayer must be a part of any Christian life. Let me say that one more time. Prayer must be a part of any Christian's life. Must be. Must be. Prayer is our communication to God. Scripture is God's communication to us. But prayer is our communication to God. Now that may sound elementary to some of you. If you've been a believer a long time, if you've been a member of the church, a Christian a long time, that may seem elementary to you. And you might think, well, why is he talking about that? Because we need to. I want to talk about six things this morning that we all need to know about prayer. Six things that we all need to know about prayer. And I want to start number one. We should pray with thanksgiving. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6, this is one of the scriptures that Lane read. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Looking back on those things that God has done for all of us. That salvation that he has made available to us through Jesus Christ. And being thankful for those things. And having confidence in those things that he can do for us in the future. Number two. God answers prayers. We need to believe that. That's the second thing we need to know about about prayer. If we don't believe that God answers prayers, then why do we pray? Why do we go to the trouble to pray if we don't believe that God will answer our prayers? I'm going to tell you, I know personally, and I'm not going to go into details about this, but I know personally, without any doubt in my mind, that God answers prayers. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, it's the following scripture that we just read. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Sometimes the answer to our prayers is no. Sometimes that answer is no. We ask for a lot of things and we don't always have the wisdom to comprehend the consequences thereof. But God does. God knows what we need before we ask. He knows what our life requires. And He is able to separate regardless of whether or not you and I are, whether it is a need, 
or a want. So we have to trust that God knows those things. Maybe he's using a delayed answer to teach us something. Maybe he's using a delayed answer to cause us to grow. Sometimes that answer is yes, and it's immediate. Sometimes that answer is yes, and it's so. Sometimes that answer is no, and it's immediate. And sometimes it takes years to get that answer to that prayer. Number three, or wait just a minute. God is not limited in how he can answer prayers. He can use people. He can use events. He can use time. He can use physical or spiritual means. God has the power to answer prayer in whatever means he deems necessary. In our day and time, a providential response is common. That is, God using the laws of nature. God working through natural things to answer our prayers. And I think about reading stories in the Old Testament, how even in that day and time, God did that. He always has. I can think about one situation in the Old Testament where he used hailstones from a hailstorm to destroy an army of the enemy of the Israelites. Talk about using natural means, working through nature, destroying an army with giant hailstones. I don't know about you, but every time I've ever been in a hailstorm, I've been inside, and I've seen some little hail. But I've seen some cars that have been in a hailstorm that have been outside, and I'm going to tell you straight up, I don't want those hailstones to hit me because uh, I know my head is pretty hard, but I don't think it's that hard. A miraculous response was common in Jesus' time. Some of the stories in the New Testament make it obvious that in Christ's time, it was to be undeniable evidence that the messenger and the message was genuinely from God. I think sometimes we think about miracles in terms of New Testament times and how God used miracles through His Son and the Apostles and He answered prayers in those ways even to the point of raising people from the dead. We don't see people doing that today. We don't see people raising someone from the dead today like the Apostle Paul did, like Jesus did. Those were miraculous. Those were miracles answered to prayers. Number three, number three, we need to pray to God the Father. Well, you say, well, that sounds obvious. But now wait a minute. Scripturally, Scripturally, if we're going to pray in accordance with God's will, we need to pray to Him. Luke chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. Go with me there, if you will. Luke chapter 11. This is Jesus teaching His disciples to pray. And you're probably sitting there thinking, but now wait a minute, that's in Matthew chapter 6. It is, and we'll talk about that just in one moment. But in Luke chapter 11, I chose this specifically this morning, to remind us that many of the things that are recorded in one gospel are also recorded in other places in the gospels. Luke chapter 11, verse 2. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, or you may have a translation that uses the word trespasses or debts, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us or is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. 
Now, if you go to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew also includes in that, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know it's all in there. If you think about the elements of that prayer. You know, and I, saw, and I know today that probably seems elementary to us. But Jesus was dealing with some guys that may not have known how to pray. And sometimes we think we know how to pray, but we ought to always do it correctly because we're talking to God. It ought to be done with reverence. We ought to address God. But not only do we address God, we also pray through Jesus Christ. John chapter 14 and verse 13, number 4, we need to pray through Jesus Christ. Jesus' own words in John chapter 14 and verse 13, And whatever you seek in my name that I will do, <clears throat> excuse me, and whatever you seek in my name that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that, you may, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Talking about the Holy Spirit. You know, oftentimes today, we talk about praying through Jesus Christ. And public prayer. Public prayer is, um, it's an interesting thing in our society because when you get out into the world, in public places and there are still opportunities for Christians to pray in this society we live in without being ridiculed for it. We often hear people who just claim to be Christian but yet when they pray publicly they seem to forget who they belong to. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 33, But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, they may stop asking me to come and lead a prayer. That's fine. But I'm not going to pray publicly. Neither should you. And deny Christ. Because. If we pray publicly. We are as Christians. Representing. Christ. To whom we belong. Now it may offend someone who's not a Christian. That may happen. But I'm not going to offend Christ intentionally. And neither should you. Now, I know sometimes people get nervous. And I think about these young men as they grow up in the church and they learn to lead a prayer or to pick up cards or all these things like reading a scripture publicly. Hey, I'm going to tell you something, guys. The first time I ever led a prayer in front of the congregation, I don't believe I've ever been any more nervous in my entire life unless it was the day that I got married. I was pretty nervous that day. But I want to tell you, it's very admirable for these young fellows to come up here and to take part in the service we need to build them up we need to admonish them encourage them and if they forget to end their prayer in Jesus name we don't ever need to ridicule them because of that because they're nervous 
We all get nervous. And we don't have to be a child to get nervous and forget. It happens to everyone. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about intentionally leaving Christ out of our prayer. Number five. We need to always remember that we pray that God's will be done. Let me say that one more time because I think sometimes we think about our will, our wants, our things that we want, and it's on our mind right now, and uh, we don't always have God's will at the forefront of our prayer. Luke chapter 22 and verse 41 and 42 Luke chapter 22, start with verse 41. And he withdrew from them. This is Jesus' prayer. This is right before he was arrested. This was before he was crucified, very, very close to the time that he was crucified. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. Talking about his disciples there. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will... Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not, why, not my will, but yours be done. That's tough. Think about that just for a minute. Jesus knows his fate. He grew up in a society in which he had probably seen crucifixions take place before. He knew the gruesomeness of the responsibility that he was going to have to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. As God's son, he knew it was God's will. It's new, he knew that's what he came here for. And it comes close to the time. I don't think nervous even begins to describe it. I don't think that any of us can even understand it. From a physical standpoint, he was a man. He knew that suffering. He knew what that was all about. And yet he was still willing to say, Father, not my will, but your will. Let this cup pass from me if it be your will. He's saying, is there any other way this can be done? I think he knew the answer. What would you and I do? I don't know. Hope I never have to be in that situation. He was the perfect example of having the right attitude. Father, not your will, not my will, but your will. Number six. This is our last one, and it's uh, pray for the right things. That's one thing that we need to know about prayer is that we need to pray for the right things. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked him for. James chapter 1 and verse 6, he's talking about praying without doubting, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. James chapter 5 and verse 16, he says, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. God listens. God grants our petitions if we ask in accordance with his will. I heard a story about this school teacher. Started teaching at a young age in her career. And uh, after having taught a year of school, starting on another year and still having those students from previous experiences on her mind, she would take the yearbook and she'd open it up to the page of those students that she taught and she'd put her hand 
on that picture of that student one by one say the name of those children in her prayer to God and say a prayer for each one of them and as time went on and years went by those students became more and more and more numerous and so every morning when she'd get up to pray she would open up that yearbook and it got to where it took a long time to go through every class and put her hand on every child's picture and pray for them individually. And so eventually it got to the point where she took that yearbook and she said, God, you know who they are. I want to pray for all of them. Who do you pray for? Do you have a list? I think when we start growing spiritually, when we start growing spiritually, we stop worrying about the things we want and the things we think we need, and we start thinking about other people and the things that they need. That's a sure indicator that we're growing spiritually. When we start growing spiritually, we start thinking about what God's will is for our lives. And when we get up in the morning, we ask God, what have you got for me today? Where are you going to put me today? How are you going to use me today? That's spiritual growth. Are you there? When you read God's word, are you listening? Am I listening? Am I making God's will? important for my life? When we pray, we should understand that the words that we say to God should be an indication to us as to how much spiritual growth we have attained. And I have one prayer for each of you this morning. And that is that if you have not made Christ your Savior, that you will. I can't make you do that. Your mama, your daddy, your aunt, your uncle, your brother, your sister, your friend down the street that loves you, they can want for you, they can pray for you, they can lift you up to God every morning, every night. But they can't make you do that. You can't make me do it, and I can't make you do it. That comes from within you and me. If we have a yearning to please God, that ought to start with us being submissive to His will. That ought to be starting out with us believing that Christ is God's Son, being willing to make Him our Savior, put Him on in baptism, walk with Him, be faithful, do the best we can to be obedient. I know we make mistakes. And sometimes when we make mistakes, we go through life dwelling on those mistakes and sometimes we just need somebody to pray for us. Sometimes we need somebody to put their arm around us and tell us they love us. Lift us up to God. If you have any of those needs this morning, the invitation is offered to you at this time. Let's stand and sing.